Adrian. Yeah. Tell me about your girlfriend. I don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> you can just shy. I'm not shy. Yeah, shy. Idris is extremely bright. Shayon's creativity is exceptional. What we teach at Dalton is to teach them they have a voice. It's my best school and I love it there. I would like to be a professional basketball player when I grow up. I want Shayon to be comfortable around white folks. Because I think even at this point, I am not comfortable around white folks. How do you feel about being one of the few black kids there? Is that ever an issue? No, it's never an issue. Good try, Idris! Dalton will open doors for him for the rest of his life. You see the inauguration? At one point, I was thinking what we're doing could pay off in something like this. Not that I want you to be the president of the United States. I'm not going really good in school. You get really frustrated. My basketball team, they said, oh, you talk like a white boy. They told us that our son is a hard-to-manage guy. They don't know him. There's a cultural disconnect between independent schools and African-American boys, and the question is why. I hate school. It's bad. It's hard. The problem is focusing on class. After you leave Dalton, where do you go? I really don't want to leave. I don't think it was, frankly, a good match for him. I'd be better off if I was white. Isn't that true? This is unacceptable. Sit up! It's laziness. Something is wrong with my child. People would say, wow, you're controlling his entire life. Well, I think we weren't controlling enough. Dad is not giving up on you. I'm hard because I want you to be a better man than I am. I think I'm ready for college. I can't take life for granted. It feels so right. Just calling my name. There's nothing you can't do in this world. We back you up all the way. The Triumph Award goes to Shea Summers. This is just the beginning. Even through all the struggles, I feel like I'm going places. You should be proud. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, and speak to us through words both modern and ancient. Give them new life and new relevance for our lives as we live them in these days. In your many names we pray. Amen. We hold these truths to be self evident that all are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Grateful you are here this morning. I know lots are out of town, but I think this is important. Now, I doubt you will leave here saying that was the best sermon I've ever heard. That you will leave here saying that this is one of the most important sermons you ever heard. Not because of the preacher, but because of the subject and the point I will try to make. This summer, we have been using movies as a to hear our still speaking God. We ask you for your suggestions of movies and then try to match the movies you suggested with the readings that are assigned for every Sunday. We also try to select a variety of types of movies that illustrate those, those scriptures. For today, we selected a documentary that many of you probably have not seen, but it is important. It was first put out in installments on PBS, and although it won many awards, I have to admit that American Promise, to me, was a bit slow and plodding. It follows the lives of two young African-American men for 14 years. 
age of five. Idris Brewster, a middle-class black student from Brooklyn, was being filmed by his parents, and they became documentary filmmakers. They filmed his admission into the Tony Private Dalton Preparatory School, which was at that time trying to make itself more diverse. His parents wanted to create a documentary with himself and four other students. But as it turned out, three of the five students dropped out because their parents felt that having their whole lives filmed was too intrusive. In the, own, in the end, only Idris and his best friend, Sion Summers, remained. And so as a result of that, the film took on a different character. In the end, it documented two African-American boys as they grew up. Through their parents' tenacity, these two middle-class boys grew to be young men who are today about to enter their junior year in two different colleges. Now, I can only wonder if their story would have had such power if it hadn't come out at a time when our whole nation is struggling with what it means for us to say black lives matter. What should shame us as a nation is that we even need to say those words. Are they not self-evident? Well, the parents of Trayvon Martin or Tamir Rice would believe that we don't mean them at all. Those families and so many others do not have the opportunity to work to get their sons into college. Several times I have spoken to a member of this very church about his fears about his own son. I am hardly able to hold back tears when I talk to him because of the injustice that good people are having to fear for their children like that. What must it feel like to have your own child say to you, it would have been better if I had been born white, wouldn't it? In his eulogy for Reverend Clementa Pick Pickney, President Obama called on us all to be more aware of the ways in which America has not kept its promise to so many of its citizens, saying black lives matter is not enough. By taking down that flag, we express God's grace. But I don't think God wants us to stop there. For too long, we've been blind to the way past injustices continue to shape the present. Perhaps we see that now. Perhaps this tragedy causes us to ask some tough questions about how we can permit so many of our children to languish in poverty or attend dilapidated schools or grow up without prospects for a job or for career. Perhaps it causes us to examine what we're doing to cause some of our children to hate. Perhaps it softens hearts towards those lost young men. 
tens and tens of thousands caught up in the criminal justice system and lead us to make sure that that system's not infected with bias, that we embrace changes in how we train and equip our police so that the bonds of trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve make us all safer and more secure. Maybe we now realize the way racial bias can infect us even when we don't realize it. So that we're guarding against not just racial slurs, but we're also guarding against this subtle impulse to call Johnny back for a job interview, but not Jamal. So that we search our hearts when we consider laws to make it harder for some of our fellow citizens to vote. By recognizing our common humanity, by treating every child as important, regardless of the color of their skin or the station into which they were born, and to do what's necessary to make opportunity real for every American by doing that, we express God's grace. The blood of Charleston's martyrs challenge us to take up this cause and invest our lives in it. To do so, even if our families and friends do not appreciate or understand us. In the lesson, we are told that Jesus came to his hometown. There he taught them. Perhaps he was teaching them of their enemies. Perhaps he was to welcome a stranger into their houses of faith. Perhaps he was teaching them grace and forgiveness. I know he was trying to teach his family now. In the third verse of today's gospel, it says they were repulsed by him. Now Jesus doesn't seem surprised at that. He tells the disciples, and perhaps us too, that our prophetic words will be welcomed and honored everywhere, but in our towns and among our own relatives. Yet, we cannot use that as an excuse to not speak the truth. Notice, Jesus did not avoid going to his hometown, to his own people. And he did not avoid speaking the truth to them, even though they found it repulsive. Then he sent his disciples out to do the same thing. Jesus tells him and them and perhaps us to travel light. Because when we become so burdened, so encumbered by things, by possessions, by wealth. We have to be careful. We have to be cautious, circumspect. In 1981, Bill and I were living in Atlanta and we campaigned for Jack Watson for governor. Jack Watson had been Jimmy Carter's chief of staff and he was the most progressive candidate in the race which of course meant he didn't have stand a chance of being elected governor of Georgia. Still, we tried. We took him to the bars, which back then were mostly down on Peachtree Street, and he campaigned through the night through all of these bars. Two things about that tour of bars uh, stick in my mind to this day. One was that in one of the bars where there were entertainers, the, uh, a large drag queen called Jack up onto the stage and planted a big old kiss this candidate for governor. And it didn't phase him. The other thing that I recall is that one, in one of the bars, 
I met a young man who confided in, to me that he was the nephew of Governor George Wallace. I asked him if the governor knew that he was gay. Oh, oh no, he said. If my family found out I was gay, they would disinherit me. I would never get a dime. I have colleagues who to this very day do not speak truth to power because they might lose their largest donor or even be fired. Now, this congregation might run me off for lots of things, but I doubt that preaching against racism is one of them. But what might turn you off is me insisting as Jesus did, that you travel through this world lightly enough that you are able to speak the truth, even to your family and hometown. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he confesses that he has some trait or failure or, or frailty that he has asked God three times to remove, but God did not. Now God may answer prayer, but sometimes the answer is no. And even harder, sometimes the answer is wait. Paul goes on to share with us that after asking God three times, the still speaking God taught him something new that Paul thought was beneficial to us. And that is simply God's grace is sufficient. God doesn't really need our strength or our wisdom. Rather, I think God needs our vulnerability, our openness, our authenticity. It is a risk to open your heart in a culture where there is so much fear and division. In the early 1980s, Bill and I served a small congregation in Jacksonville, Florida. When we went to that church, meeting in a very small concrete building in a mostly black, poor neighborhood. That church was firebombed three times. When I finally got the media involved, the police took us seriously. And a woman officer came out to the church and confided in me that they knew who was doing the firebombing. She pointed to a house nearby and said, the people who live in that house are white. And most of this neighborhood is African American. They'd like to look down on the African Americans, but they live in the same neighborhood with them. And they need someone else to be lower on the ladder than they are. She told me that she was going to go put the fear of God in them, but she didn't have any evidence to arrest them. Apparently, she did that because it never happened again. Now, it is an oversimplification to point to that having someone lower on the ladder as the sole cause of racism. But it is certainly a factor here in the South. People seem to need to look down on someone else in order to feel better about themselves. Have you never wondered why poor white Southerners keep voting against their own self-interests? But I think even more evil than that has been the strategy of politicians to leverage racism to get elected or to hold on to power. Now make no mistakes, both parties have at different times in our nation's history done this, divided us by race. My point 
is that we must not tolerate that any longer. Neither from our political leaders nor from our religious leaders. The church cannot be silent. We must courageously and relentlessly challenge racism wherever it is seen. To do less is unchristian and un-American. The American promise must be kept for all Americans, or it is not true for any of us. Our silence will not protect us. We must risk being repulsed even by our own families and hometowns, or we risk losing precious members of our own families. America has already lost a generation of African-American boys, youth, and men. We do hardly any better with girls and women of color. I have no doubt that a dark-skinned person might by now have found the cure for cancer if we had but given them educational opportunities, the ones that are a part of the American promise. I have no doubt that all our lives would be better if we had kept the American promise and given economic opportunities to all of our sisters and brothers. In particular, given them the same economic opportunities, for example, that we've given to Donald Trump, who has filed for bankruptcy four times. But as a white man, it is not a shame. For 22 years, I pastored a church in Dallas, Texas, which worked tirelessly to bring the American promise to LGBT people. That church and that people have made great progress. Today, I want to be part of a church that is working just as tirelessly to challenge racism, to call our country to keep its promises to all Americans regardless of the color of their skin. We must summon all the grace our souls can hold and begin by purging our own lives of hidden racism. Because only then can we challenge those who are closest to us and invite them to be a part of keeping the American promise. We must find that reservoir of goodness, that grace that gives us the will to make this a different world and to make a world of difference. What a friend of mine, the writer Marilyn Robinson calls that reservoir of goodness beyond and of another kind that we are able to do each other in the ordinary cause of things. Mm -hmm. That reservoir of goodness. Mm -hmm. If we can find that grace, uh -huh. anything is possible. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not. If we can tap that grace, uh -huh. everything can change. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet. 
sound that says.